Okay, welcome if you're joining us from the YouTubes. Uh, what we're gonna do today is we're gonna look at two quizzes, I hope. We'll see if we have time for both. One quiz is gonna be on standing waves and one quiz is gonna be on interference. So the goal of today is uh, not necessarily to complete these quizzes, hopefully we can get close, but the goal is just to be clear on like fundamentally where each of my ideas is coming from and, uh, and yeah, how I can use that to kind of leverage my way into solving each problem. So I'm gonna to try to also key, on, key in on what, uh, what some like key terms are that let me know how to relate them to, to certain concepts or equations we covered in DL. Okay, let's do it. So let's start by reading. A standing wave formed by an air column in a pipe is detected when the sound produced by strike, striking a tuning force fork is greatly amplified, also known as resonance. The length of the pipe, nice, it's 0.5 meters and the speed of sound is 340 meters per second. Different tuning forks of increasing frequency are used until the first resonance standing wave is heard in the pipe with both ends open. Then more tuning forks are used with increasing frequencies until a tuning fork is found such that a second resonance is heard. Plot the standing wave pattern using displacement in pressure. All right, so they want us to use pressure produced by the final tuning fork. Calculate the frequency of this tuning fork. Okay, cool. So um, it's not immediately clear where they want us to plot it. I'm just going to go ahead and plot it as though it's like inside of this tube. So here's an axis, here's pressure. They said to plot the standing wave pattern using displacement, displacement and pressure. So usually when we talk about sound waves, we're going to represent them in pressure. It's kind of obnoxious to represent them as like particle displacement. So as far as we're concerned, sound waves are basically pressure waves. You have variations in pressure uh, corresponding to like dense and less dense regions of particles. With me so far, is this okay? Thumbs up if you're like, yeah, all right. Uh, can I get the can I get the wow face or the the mouth open face if you're like go faster? <laughs> okay, cool. All right, so we've plotted, or no, we've, I just put an axis down. Let's go and actually plot the thing. So we'll plot as a function of distance here from zero to 0.5 meters. And uh, so let's be clear which standing wave we're gonna need to plot. So there's a couple of questions I need to ask myself. The first is, is this a situation where I've got one end fixed uh, and one end free, or a situation where I've got two ends fixed? One end fixed, one end free, or two ends fixed. These are the two kinds of standing waves we've learned about. So the key intuition for sound waves, most of the time, is that edges of a pipe, edges of a pipe are at constant pressure. They're at atmospheric pressure. And I wanna say we saw that in 7B, right? That's probably reaching back a bit. But in 7B, we saw that the edges, the exposed ends of a pipe are at atmospheric pressure. Atmospheric pressure. Okay, and there's a little bit of nuance to that claim, but I'm not gonna just just take it for now. <laughs> there's a little bit of nuance there, but for what it's for for our purposes, uh, the pipe represents kind of like a little miniature inside controlled environment, and the atmosphere is like this big outside thing that's at constant pressure. So the edges are at at, at constant pressure, which means that the edges are fixed. They're going to be nodes no matter what. And what I'll do is. I'm going to go ahead and put in a little N here just to remind myself that these are nodes. Nodes at the end. Okay, so now I can think a little bit about what kinds of standing waves are going to occur for this pipe. So I've determined that it's going to be two ends fixed. So my different uh, standing waves look like this. Node, node, one antinode. There's one that looks like this. That's the second harmonic. And then the third harmonic, whoa, and so on. Okay, so they just keep getting more wiggly. <clears throat> they tell us in the problem that they find the first resonance, the first standing wave, and then they find the second standing wave. So that second one is the one we're interested in plotting. Plot the standing wave pattern produced by the final tuning fork, the second tuning fork. So we're interested in the second uh, standing wave, n equals two, which is gonna have one, two antinodes, splitting it into thirds, or not into thirds, that's actually along fourths, but it doesn't matter too much, with a node in the center, node in the center, like this. 
there's my n equals two standing wave. Whoa. This is the n equals two standing wave. Wait, nope. how did you know it was n equals two? Is it because it says second resonance is true? That's right. That's right. So okay. I had to use a little bit of new language. Like in, in class, we haven't said anything, at least I haven't seen anything that says first resonance, right? Yeah. How come the wave also, how come also the wave doesn't look like uh, that for one that has like one fixed end and one open end? Sure. Okay. That's a little bit of a larger question. Um, so let's go over here for a second. So this is diverging a little bit now from the quiz, just so everybody's clear, but it's a really important question. So I want to, I want to touch on it. Yeah. So the question was, why doesn't the standing wave look like this? Why doesn't the standing wave look like this when we have one end fixed and one end free, i.e. one end closed to the atmosphere and one end open to the atmosphere? So this side's going to be my closed side. Actually, tell you what, I'm going to, I'm going to switch it around just for my own sanity. <laughs> so I'm going to make this side the closed side. Closed. And this side will be my open side. Okay, so on the way to drawing this wave over here, this standing wave, I said that these two sides, the edges of this pipe have to be nodes because both sides are exposed to atmosphere and atmosphere has a constant atmospheric pressure. So it's fixed, right? Does that make sense? If it's, uh, if it's constant, then it's fixed. Kind of means the same thing, right? However, if I close one end of my pipe, that side is no longer exposed to atmosphere. No longer exposed to atmosphere. Wow, can I spell? There we go. All right, and when that end is no longer exposed to atmosphere, the, uh, the pressure is no longer forced to be that one value, atmospheric pressure, BATM. So since, since we've closed that end, that end is now free. It becomes an antinode for a standing wave. I'm gonna mark that in red. So the standing waves for this form are fixed. I'm going to draw my dotted little axes here. So I have a fixed end where it's open, and I have an unfixed end at the antinode. So my standing waves look instead like this. I've got one that's kind of like a, what is that, a quarter of a wavelength. I've got one that is three quarters of a wavelength. Whoa, all right. I've got one that is a little less than that. Can I do this right? I can. Here we go. We're all right. So like this. Okay, I understand. So then yeah. like, would the graph be the same over the one that's both ends open? Would it be the same as when you have two, both ends fixed? That's right. That's right. Both ends open is the same as both ends fixed. Wait, so why so, exactly is that? So it's, uh, it's because the pressure is fixed. So the, the variable that we're graphing here is the pressure. And at, at either end of the tube, those ends of the tube are open to the atmosphere. So um, if I look just outside the tube a little bit, say I go over here, all of these little points I'm drawing in all have the same pressure. They're all atmospheric pressure. And by a similar logic, the point right at the edge of the tube, at least in ideal circumstances, is also at atmospheric pressure. Inside the tube, pressure can vary. It's allowed to, it's allowed to it's allowed to vary a little bit as we pump yeah, but it. But for both yeah. ends fixed, isn't it that that's not exposed to atmospheric pressure, so it's not the same? So if both ends are fixed, uh, both are at atmospheric pressure. Wait, so why is that? Because isn't it fixed means that it's closed? No, good. Yeah, that's the, that's the critical thing. It's kind of counterintuitive, right? Yeah. So if we, if we close the tube, if we close the tube, it's not required to be at atmospheric pressure. Um, the pressure is allowed to vary. One way I might say this is kind of like. Oh, so I mean, does fixed mean open to the atmosphere? That's right. That's right. Oh, so they're, okay. they're not equivalent. Fixed refers more generally for standing waves. Uh, fixed can apply to any of a different, any of a number of different variables that we're measuring. So if I say okay. two ends fixed, that always means, you know, fixed at both ends. Closed refers specifically to pressure uh, in the context of pressure waves. So if I close okay, so, the pipe, yeah. it acts like... So if it has like, two fixed ends, does that mean it has both ends open? If it has two fixed ends, that means that the tube has both ends open. Yeah, uh, that's right. Okay, thank you. Yeah, sure thing. Okay, thanks for that clarification. All right, more questions while we're here?
they say seven seconds. You're supposed to wait seven seconds in real life. I think it's a bit longer online. <laughs> oh, and also second resonance means second harmonic, right? That's right, that's right. Okay. So we had to use context clues a little bit here, but they let us know that resonance means the same thing as standing wave up here. Good stuff, thank you. All right. So now we've plotted it, let's calculate the frequency. Here we go. So what have we found? We've found a wave with wavelength 0.5 meters, right? Another way we could look at this, if I, did, if I didn't just kind of want to look at this directly and say, all right, what is the wavelength of this wave? Well, it's one wave and it's 0.5 meters long. Another way I could do that is by calculating the wavelength directly from this equation, which is the equation for the allowed wavelength of a standing wave for a tube of finite length. Uh, sorry, yeah, this is a tube of finite length and N is just an integer. Zero, not, not zero, sorry, zero is not allowed. Huh. One, two, three, four, et cetera. So if I wasn't sure, I could just plug in, whoa, yeah, we're good. If I wasn't sure, I could just plug in N equals two. So two L over two makes L. The wavelength of my wave is just the length of the tube. And we see that here, 0.5 meters. Is that all right? Okay, so sorry, I know that probably sounded a little circular. I'm trying to say there's two different ways to get there from what we have in the problem so far. One way is just by looking at the graph, so to speak, the graph of pressure versus position. So I can see that this is one wave. And as it happens, one wave fits into 0.5 meters. So the wavelength is 0.5 meters. That's kind of like the, the easy, kind of like what I think of as a shortcut way for this particular problem. But in other problems, maybe I don't have quite as simple an N, maybe I have N equals five instead and I wanna just calculate it. I could also just head over here to this equation for the allowed wavelengths, the allowed wavelengths um, for a tube, or sorry, for a standing wave in a tube of fixed length. All right, so there we go. I've got my wave in a tube. I know its length and we have this great relation that lets us transition between frequency wavelength and velocity, which is V equals lambda F or lambda over T. So this is something I had to, this equation I had to remember, in a, like I had, to, I had to recall that this was the thing that related wavelength to, uh, to velocity. So anytime you're asked to like find a frequency or find a wavelength or find a velocity, this equation should always be one of the first things that pops in, pops, you know, pops up. Okay, so again, this one, like the, the hard part of this problem was remembering this relation and relating it to this need to calculate the frequency. So let's do that. Let's go ahead and calculate. So I wanna find the frequency. Frequency is just gonna be V over lambda. V is the speed of uh, waves in the medium, which is the speed of sound. Lambda is just the wavelength, 0.5 meters, which is gonna be 680, Hertz. As a quick side note, I can always double check my units. So 340 meters per second divided by meters gives me uh, units of one over second, inverse second, which is what a Hertz is. All right, hopefully that checks out. So I've drawn my graph, I've calculated my frequency, done. Pause for a second here, see if there are questions, but also let me get uh, let me get some reactions again. Oh, wait, I got a bunch of chats. Let's look at the chats. Holy cow. Sorry, I missed them. Okay, looks like we mostly addressed these. I see one that says, so is N always the number of resonance we find ourselves at? Like right now we're at the second resonance and A equals two. Yes, that's right. So if I say the second standing wave or the second resonance, that'll be N equals two. If I say the eighth standing wave or the eighth resonance, that'll be n equals eight. Um, another, another term that we use sometimes interchangeably is harmonic, yeah. So if you say the, the 18th harmonic, that's the same as n equals 18, yep. And coincidentally, or not really coincidentally, kind of by design, that'll also be the same as the number of antinodes, same as the number of antinodes. It's not necessarily the same as the number of nodes, <laughs> which maybe we can get into later, but n refers to the number of antinodes, which is the same as the, the number of the harmonic. 
Wait, so does n also equal the number of antinodes when you're looking at one fixed end and one open end? That's right. Yep. That's that's oh. that's actually why we use antinodes instead of nodes. Oh, yeah. so antinodes, number of antinodes applies for whatever type of tube, regardless if it's open both or one open only. And that's right. Yep. Would Whether it also work if you have both ends closed? So both ends closed is kind of a hard one uh, okay. because it's kind of like both ends are free, right? So both ends closed. I don't know if there's a really a great. Well, I'm sure there's a good way to say, think about standing waves there. Regardless, okay. So what I'll say is it's outside the purview of the course, <laughs> but uh, I want to say it would still work there too. Yeah. So we'll always have either both ends fixed or one end fixed, one end free. We'll never have both ends free. Both ends free. My my intuition is that that means there's no standing wave. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Although, yeah. all right, anyway, I'm, I'm going to leave that one behind. Uh, okay. Part B. Oh, let me get some uh, reactions too. So if you want speed up, give me a thumbs up. If you want speed down, let's get, uh, let's get heart. And if you're like, I'm all right, don't worry about it. Okay, let's speed up. All right, let's do it. One of the ends is closed with the piston as shown below. Explain what happens with the resonance sound if the same tuning fork in A is used. All right, so let's look at this. What happens if we do that? Well, now we're in the realm of one end fixed, one end free. One end fixed and one end free. So a standing wave here would require that I have a node on this end and an anti-node on this end. I've got one end fixed, right? Open to atmosphere. PATM. I've got one end free. It can be whatever, whatever pressure it wants, any pressure. So when I close, uh, when I close one end of the, when I close one end <laughs> of my pipe, what happens is that I no longer get a standing wave that I would get in the, uh, let's back that up. Okay. When I close one end, what happens is I cannot have a standing wave of the same frequency as before. So if I were to have a, a wave of the same frequency, it would have a node at both ends. If it has a node at both ends, you know that doesn't really make sense for, uh, for a system which has one end fixed, one end free. The free end would be wiggling around, right? Can't be a node. So basically, I'm gonna start typing this one out because this is a, this is really more of a word word problem. Hello. Can I zoom? Hello. All right. Explain what happens to the resonant sound. The resonant sound will not continue as the previous frequency frequency only generated a standing wave for two ends fixed. Another way to say this, I'm gonna make this a bit smaller, it's getting harder to type. Another way to say this is because the previous frequency puts a node at the closed end of the pipe, it is not a standing wave. In other words, when I close one end, because the condition for my standing wave has changed, that is one end, one end closed, one end open, instead of two ends open, the standing wave would no longer exist here. I have to, I have to change something else. Can't use the same tuning fork. Um, another way to say this, I know I'm like trying to rephrase it like 12 different ways. <laughs> another way to say this is that if I've got, uh... yeah, here you go. I'll, I'll say it this way. The wavelengths associated with both ends open are, are different at every step from the wavelengths that are acceptable for one end open, one end closed. 
So if you look up here, these are always different. Any exceptions to that? I don't think so. Well, wait, maybe there are. There may be some where they overlap. But at least for the first few n, these are different, right? Well, I thought that there would still be a potential frequency if you change it. That's right. So it's not that we can't have any standing waves ever that form in here. It's just that this particular frequency doesn't generate a standing wave when I cover up one end. Oh, so when it says what happens with the resonant sound, is it talking about the earlier frequency? That's right. The same tuning, tuning fork used above, this, uh, this tuning fork here from the previous part. Oh, OK. OK. Let's hit the last one. The piston above is free to move. I feel like, yeah, I feel like, I feel like attention to this problem is slowly dying off. So I want to, I want to, I want to respect that kind of push through it. So uh, the piston shown above is free to move. Thus, you are able to shorten the length of the pipe. Find the longest length of pipe you can have in order to generate a standing wave pattern using the same tuning fork. Show the length calculation and plot the resulting standing wave pattern below. So I'm allowed to push the piston into the pipe. So uh, I'm not allowed to pull it out and kind of like generate more pipe with me. So whatever I do, I'm gonna have to move it in tighter. So I wanna find the longest length of pipe that I can have to generate a standing wave pattern using the same tuning fork. In other words, I wanna find, so let's rephrase this problem in terms of, in terms of things we know. I want to find the smallest N such that I have a standing wave um, smaller than L. Yeah, there we go. That's the way to say it. So what do I mean by this? Let's, let's think about this in a little more detail. So I need to have a standing wave, right? Previously in part B, I couldn't just keep the tuning fork from part A because that tuning fork wouldn't generate a standing wave in this new setup with one end closed, one end open. So what I need to do instead is find the smallest n, the smallest, the smallest, or the uh, the lowest harmonic, which gives me a large wavelength, but which is inside of my length, which is inside of the tube. So I can't just plug in n equals you know n equals one and call it a day because I'll get an l that's larger than 0.5 meters. So let's let's kind of break this out uh, by show of hands. Which, which of these two equations is relevant here? So toss me, a, toss me a thumb if you're like the first one, toss me an open mouth if you're like the second one. So we're talking about the situation with one end closed and one end open. Yeah, right, it helps you can look around. <laughs> so, so, okay, so for this one, because we've closed this, the side of this tube with a piston, I've got one end open and one end closed. So the relevant equation is this one, the standing waves, the, the wavelength of a standing wave for a pipe of finite length uh, with a variable n, this, this integer n. So these tell me all of the possible standing waves that I can have in this tube. So let's pull that down. The allowed wavelengths are 4L over 2N minus 1, with N greater than or equal to 1. OK, so let's try to, I'm going to try to demonstrate <clears throat> some possible allowed wavelengths here. So let's just plug in a few values for N and see what pops out. Hello. All right, so if I say N equals 1, what do I get? Well. Then I get an allowed wavelength, which is uh, 4L over 1, so 4L. If I say n equals 2, then that gives me a wavelength, which is 4L over 4 minus 1, which is 4 thirds L. If I do n equals 3, I get a wavelength, which is, uh, can I do this math, 4L over 5. And if I do n equals 4, I get a wavelength, which is 4L over 7. All right. So now is the time, if you're, if, you're, if you're zoning out a little bit, now's the time to kind of ratchet back in. Here's where the critical intuition comes from. 
So the critical intuition is here. So I want to find, I want to find the longest length of pipe that I can have in order to generate a standing wave pattern using the original tuning fork, the original tuning fork. So, um, sorry, totally spaced out. One second. <laughs> okay, hang on. Let me let me let me think about this for more, one more second. So these are the possible wavelengths I can have. Oof, for a given L. All right. Now, what I'd like to do is find the smallest L that I can have using the previous wavelength. So what was the previous wavelength? The previous wavelength was 0.5 meters. OK, let's plug that in. So 0.5 equals 4L in the case of the first one. 0.5 equals 4 thirds L in the second one. What is so when it says uh, the same tuning fork, does it mean the same wavelength? That's right. Yep, the same tuning fork and as then, above. Okay, and then it would also be the same frequency, right? Yep, same frequency. Okay. Yep, same thing. Good catch. Okay, so each of these are uh, letting me know some lengths, some possible lengths that I could have for my, uh, what do you call this? For my tuning fork, or not for my tuning fork, for my, for my pipe. So let's see. Yeah, so what I would like then is to find one that gives me a length that is smaller than 0.5 meters. Yeah. Okay, so for n equals three, that would mean 0.5 equals 4L over 5, 4L over 5, there we go. And for N equals 4, that would mean that 0.5 is 4L over 7. Inverting these for L, I'm going to make a nice little table down here. N equals 1, or N equals, and the corresponding length required for that. So at N equals 1. Well, and also, you can't use N equal to a negative number, right? Because then L would be negative. That's right. So in general, we, we won't use uh, n to be a negative number. If we did, that would mean that uh, that would correspond to, I think that would typically correspond to negative wavelengths. Yeah, which doesn't make sense. Wavelengths have to be positive. OK, n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3, and n equals 4. Those are the, the four we considered. So for n equals 1, I have that l would need to be 2 meters. Well, that's not going to fit in our pipe. Our pipe is only 0.5 meters long. For n equals 2, I have that L would need to be 3 quarters hey, of 5. How come for n equals 1, it's 2 meters? Isn't it 0.5 divided by 4? Hello, what did I do here? 0.5. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Okay. Whoops. Did I make a mistake? Hang on, let me look at this for a second. 4L over. Now I feel as though I've made a mistake. So I have to put this is one eighth. Hmm. One second, sorry folks. Maybe I'm okay with this. Give me just a second. Yep, let, let's see. Um Okay, so n equals, okay, so if you x one, l is one eighth, fine. Uh, let's say I do n equals two, what do I get in that situation? I get three quarters of 0.5, which I wish I remembered how to do that. <laughs> okay, 0.375. If I do l equal, or n equals three, I get five fourths of 0.5, which is 0.65. And if I get, n equals four, I do seven fourths times 0.5, which is 0.875 meters. Okay, so let's backtrack this a little bit. Let's backtrack this a little bit. What I want is to find a length 
less than 0.5 such that I have a standing wave and I want the longest possible of those lengths. So n equals two is the one that satisfies that for us. So 0 0.375, 0 0.375 m. Okay, and actually that means that I made a mistake earlier on. I don't actually wanna find the smallest n such that I have a standing wave smaller than L. I wanna find the largest n such that I have a standing wave smaller than 0 0.5 meters. Okay, so I know that one was kind of confusing. What I wanna do is take a second to kind of give you a broad strokes overview. What did I do to approach this problem? Because it ended up getting a little convoluted. So what I did was, First, I tried to frame the problem in terms of n and some lengths. So I wanted to find the longest length of pipe that I could have, the largest, the largest L that I could have, less than 0.5, such that I could generate a standing wave using the previous frequency. So using lambda equals 0.5, find the largest n such that L is less than 0.5. I was looking for the biggest possible standing wave I could find uh, that still fit inside of, um, yeah, that still fit inside of this pipe. Adam, I'm getting stuck on something. Sure. So we said that we want to use the same tuning fork throughout, and the, the tuning fork in the beginning was at the second resonance, which would get us n equals two, right? So in C, don't we start out with the assumption that n equals two? So here's the thing. Uh, it may be true that the largest wavelength it may be true that there's, there's a one-on-one -on -one correspondence there. Like it looks like this is probably a rule that if you have the, the N from the previous, then, then uh, the N, sorry. If you have the N with both ends open, then that'll correspond to a smaller N with both ends or with one end fixed, one end free. But uh, it's not like a, it's not an immediate thing, no. So we couldn't, I don't think there's a straightforward way to just assume that and will equal, equal two throughout the problem. So to kind of like motivate that a little bit, say that we'd gone the other way. So if we'd said first, okay, n equals two for the one side closed, one side open. And then we said, all right, here's my L, I've got 0.375 meters. What's the corresponding longest wavelength such that if I pushed in a piston, uh, or sorry, such that if I lopped off part of the pipe, with both ends and made both ends open, I would have uh, I would have a standing wave. In that case, we would need to go from n equals two for the one end fixed, one end free, to n equals one for the both ends fixed. Um, so that's a quick little like attempt at a verbal explanation. But the key takeaway is that it's not a general rule that the n corresponding to both ends fixed will correspond with uh, the n of one end fixed, one end free. Yeah, so there's a little bit more work we have to do on the side. Um, okay, so it isn't that the tuning fork is stuck or static at the second resonance. It was just, it just happened to be at the second resonance in part A. So it's that the tuning fork, it is stuck at a, at a particular frequency. It's stuck at a particular frequency. That frequency happens to be associated with a particular N for our first pipe. With, uh, with both ends closed. However, that frequency of the tuning fork is not necessarily associated with the same end, the same harmonic, when we close one side of the tube. Oh, yeah. oh okay, so it's not that the tuning fork gives us N, it's the tuning fork plus the pipe. Exactly, yep, that's right. Okay, cool, yep. and, thank you. And it's, it's, uh, it's really just the, the pipe itself tells us what possible frequencies it would accept, kind of. The pipe alone tells us what standing waves would fit in it. Um, and then the tuning fork plus the, plus the pipe tells us which end it is, yeah. Oh, and also, what exactly is the resonance found? 
So when we say resonance or harmonic or standing wave, it all means the same thing. Um, if it says what happens with the resonant sound, yeah, I, I think the idea here is that like I'm literally, I've got my tube, and then I literally imagine it's hollow on both ends. I've got my tube, and then I literally close both one end while I'm still sounding the tuning fork, and the key is just yeah. that that sound will die off. Yeah. Whereas previously okay. it would have been resonant, now it'll die off. Okay, so can you explain the last statement where you said because the previous frequency puts a note at the closed end of the pipe, it is not a standing wave? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, uh, this thing right here. Yeah. So, because the previous frequency, right, because the previous frequency puts, here we go, to draw it in, the previous frequency tries to make a standing wave that looks like this, right? Yeah. It tries to make a standing wave that has one end fixed and the other end also fixed. Yeah. However, because this end over here is actually free, yeah, it doesn't produce a standing wave. Um, I don't know if I think y'all probably saw the simulation in your DLs where you had one wave come in and the other wave move back. Is that familiar? One wave that's usually a red wave and one wave that's blue does this. So because the okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna say something technical as kind of a way to sweep this under the rug. But what I've said before is is the key takeaway uh, is that if you try to stick a node where an anti node actually is, that's not a standing wave. Wait, so a standing so, wave is when you have both ends open always, but never when you have one end open and one end closed. So they both generate standing waves, but they're yeah. two different kinds of standing waves. Okay, so for B, it can't generate the standing wave that the tuning fork would initially give. That's right, because we've changed, we call this the boundary condition. We've changed one side of the pipe to be different than yeah. it was before without changing the tuning fork. So we okay. haven't changed the frequency, but we have changed the allowed wavelengths. Okay. Could you explain one last time what the resonant sound is? Is it just the frequency or something? Right. When we say resonant sound, uh, I mean, I think here, so they're saying like the, you know, the sound that you perceive, what, yeah. what would happen to that previously resonant sound? And it would die off. Right? Would go away. That's right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. And yeah. then could you also do for C, like the plot for it? Yeah. Uh, show the length calculation plot the resulting standing wave pattern below. So, I know it's n equals two and it's the n equals two wave for one end free, one end fixed. So let's do a plot. Here's the pressure, here's the position. It's n equals two, so I'm gonna have two antinodes. And what I'll do is I'll just, let's see here. I'll put an antinode over here at 0.375. This is where my piston will now be, piston. Okay, so there's at x equals 0.375, there's gonna be an antinode. All right, and there'll also be a node here, a node at the end that's open to the atmosphere. Uh, what else, what else, what else? We'll have a second antinode somewhere. I'm gonna put that antinode down here, okay? And it'll be, what? It'll be a third of the way down the pipe. So we'll have a node two thirds of the way down, an antinode one third of the way down, and an antinode all the way down. No, I just draw in my way. So how do you know then the antinode and the node were at those specific positions? Yeah, sure. So um, honestly, for me, part of that's just intuition now. <laughs> but uh, so I know that nodes and antinodes are equally spaced apart. So nodes and antinodes are all uh, one quarter of one wavelength away from each other. Lambda over four. Uh, psh, 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 this is going to be lambda over two. And this is going to be three lambda over four. Oh, I see. Thank you. Yeah, sure thing. Adam, um, hey. on the last graph, like when you drew it, you went like up first, like when your curve, you started going yeah, up it doesn't matter. and you went down. It doesn't matter. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Okay. I just like, so usually I like drawing it up first, but that's just because I like sign. Like I like the, the sign function going up first, but yeah, negative sign is also fine. So you, you wouldn't be penalized, definitely, if you drew okay. either. Yeah. Both Thank expensive. you. And in fact, I've even seen, I mean, people also sometimes will draw in both, like, like they'll do this. And we don't mind that either. My preference personally is just drawing one side like this. But uh, if you draw, yeah, if you draw both or either, it's totally fine. Uh, Sandeep asks, can we say we went from resonance two to resonance one? Sorry, I know that was a long time ago. Wow, sorry, not monitoring chat as well as I should be. Um, so in the in the second counter example I gave, we could say that uh, and, equal, and from and we went from n equals two to n equals one. But in this example, 
we're going from n equals two in one geometry, i.e. both ends open, to a new geometry where n is still two, i.e. one end open, one end closed. Yeah. Which it's okay. I'm, I'm kind of hearkening back to a while ago. So if you're watching the video post facto, you can rewind and see where I talked about that a little more. But, but if not, don't worry about it too much. Okay, so we've got about 15 minutes left. Um, how are we doing, everybody? Can I get, can I get, uh, let's see, let's use a new reaction. I'm having fun with this. Can I get uh, crying, laughing, if you're doing all right? Uh, heart, if you're like, OMG, tired. Get me out of here. Okay, okay, okay. I know we slowed down a little bit there toward the end of that one. I think I, I'm hoping that that was still a useful conversation to have, um, but we'll try to pick it back up again for the last one. Okay, last questions about standing waves. Standing waves, final questions. Okay, cool. Uh, if you're still if you're still typing about it, feel free. I'll come back to it in just a sec. All right, now this is kind of doing a little bit of uh, almost review probably. So hopefully, again, this will be useful, but worst case scenario, we can at least solidify some concepts we've already talked about in DL. So question is, you're lost in a desert. There are two radio towers eight kilometers apart, both transmitting radio waves of frequency 3.75 times 10 to the fourth hertz. Seems kind of low. All right, whatever. Waves from tower B are pi over two ahead of waves from tower A. This is an important piece of verbiage, ahead of waves from tower A. So obnoxious. I remember when I learned this, I was like, oh my God, can I just, this definition is so annoying. So when we say ahead of, what we mean is this. So phi B, this is the initial phase of B minus the initial phase of A is lambda, or it's pi over two. So when I say this thing is ahead of this other thing, I mean that the initial phase of that first thing subtracted, or sorry, if I subtract the initial phase of the second thing from the initial phase of the first thing, that's the number I get. That's what it means. So here, if tower B is ahead by pi over two, that means that the initial phase of B minus the initial phase of A is equal to pi over two. Whew. There you go. All right, uh, I'll try to be extra explicit about that just because I, have, I, hate, I hate that language. I think it's really annoying and it doesn't, it doesn't tell me a lot. <laughs> okay, but so uh, the radio signals are interfering with your GPS, not allowing you to find your way out. Well, that wasn't even a question. Let's go down. Calculate and mark on the picture all possible locations on a straight line between the two towers where there is no signal from the two radio towers. Show all your work. So what we want to do is we want to find re regions where there is no signal. So no signal or like silence. These should always be little verbal cues that we're talking about destructive interference. And the thing to remember about destructive interference, the, the fundamental thing to remember is that that means that the difference in phase between the two sources, total phase, so I'll capitalize it by drawing little bars, the difference in total phase between the two sources is an odd integer multiple of, sorry, yeah, it's an odd integer of pi. Yep, so 2n plus 1 pi. And you might see it also 2n minus 1. It doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, and, you know, n just does what n does. I'll make it minus because I feel like y'all probably seen minus before. 2n minus 1 pi. I can't remember that for sure. But regardless, because n's an integer, um, it's the same thing. 2n minus 1 is the same as 2n plus 1. Shifted by an index. All right. <clears throat> So what I want to do is find regions where this total phase difference is 2n minus 1 pi. So what we'll do is I'm going to make a simplified phase chart. Wow. So uh, but, but, but the first part is the spatial part. Wait. No, the first part's the temporal part. How long has it been since I took this class? 2 pi t over tau. Then minus, and this will be a delta, delta t over tau, minus Bruh, just write the thing, Adam, come on. Two pi t delta of one over tau. There we go. All right, the spatial part, minus two pi delta of x over lambda. And the last part is the initial phase, which is delta phi naught. 
Remember, this is just the things inside of the sign in our original wave equation. So uh, the total is just all those things added up. So total. Okay, <clears throat> first of all, they're both transmitting with a frequency of 3.75 times 10 to the fourth hertz. So if the frequencies are the same, since frequency is one over period, that means the periods are the same. So this one doesn't contribute. All right, they're also the same wavelength. Let's go ahead and calculate that wavelength just for my sanity. <laughs> so the wavelength, again, using the formula V equals lambda F, I can calculate the wavelength is just uh, V over F. So since these are radio towers, the V is the speed of light, three times 10 to the eighth meters per second. They shouldn't V be the speed of sound. So in this case, because they are radio towers, so radio waves, and this might be something we haven't talked about explicitly yet. I think we have, yeah. but I think, I wanna say that we have, but if not, we'll say it now, which is that um, radio waves are just light waves. So uh, light when waves, we have, okay. right, it's electromagnetic waves, which is just light again. It's just, uh, you know, lower energy. So um, yeah, that's right, lower energy. S Yes. Okay. I feel good about it. <laughs> so, um, so radio waves travel with the speed of light, not the speed of sound. Instead of being pressure waves, uh, they are light waves. Good question. Thank you. So it's three times ten to the eighth for our speed, and our frequency is three point seven five times ten to the fourth hertz. Uh, I wish I had my calculator a little faster. So what is that? Three times ten to the eighth divided by 3.75 times 10 to the fourth, I get out a wavelength of 8,000 meters. Does that make sense? I feel okay about it. I don't feel great about it. To me, that feels really long. Is my math good? My math looks pretty good. Yeah, math looks good. All right, and this is, okay. So actually before, I remember now, before you remember when I said, that frequency feels kind of low. That's why. It's because this is a pretty low frequency for, for a radio wave, I'm pretty sure. That, that feels really low. But so 8,000 meters for a wavelength. Fair enough. <laughs> okay. Oh, the scales in kilometers. Oh, okay. Okay, cool. So in other words, the wavelength is eight kilometers. We'll just go ahead and convert that for our convenience. All right, <clears throat> final step. So, okay, so sorry, I should probably write that in. Let's write that in over here on our phase chart. This is gonna be negative two pi over eight. Remember, we're measuring kilometers times delta X. Okay, and our phase difference, let's go ahead and define delta X to be X B minus X A. What I have to do if I define, so let's talk about delta for a second. If I define my delta for one variable, i.e. delta x, I have to keep that convention through the rest. So if I define my delta x to be xb minus xa, that means that my delta phi, my, de my delta initial phase has to be the same. Phi naught b minus phi naught a. So you see what I've done? The key is that I have to keep this consistent. It has to be B minus A throughout the problem. I can pick either. I can pick either B minus A or A minus B, but I have to pick one and stick with it throughout. So this is called, uh, I call it like establishing my delta, defining my delta. Okay, uh, questions there? All right. Or questions about anything else that we've talked about so far? I know this one's, it's been a minute since I paused for questions. All right, I'm just gonna keep on going then. All right, hang on. Okay, let's keep on going. We'll see what you, we'll see how you feel in a sec. So the difference in phase b minus a. So b the the final is pi over two. A it's just zero. So b minus a is gonna give me pi over two here. And the total I'm requiring for destructive interference that the total will be two n minus one lambda. Or sorry, lambda two n minus one pi. <laughs> lambdas. Okay. So let's go ahead and make this into an equation and then we'll solve. 
So I want to find places where this equation is satisfied. Yuck. Let's go ahead and solve it back for delta x. So delta x is going to tell me positions. It's going to tell me it's going to be a proxy for some positions where I find destructive interference. And then we have to talk briefly about the definition of delta x. Uh, I think that's where we'll stop, given the time. So let's go ahead and solve back for delta x. So delta x, uh, I'm going to be a little lazy. So this is going to be negative 1 over 4 x. I'm going to divide both sides by pi. This is going to be 2n minus 3 over 2. OK, so I cheated a couple of steps there. I divided by pi and subtracted the side over. Let's go ahead and do that last step. So delta x needs to be negative 8n plus 6. Cool. <laughs> Convenient. Works out to a nice round number. So um, 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 what else? OK, so this is my required path length difference, negative 8n minus 6, with n being uh, some integer, positive or negative, doesn't matter for us. So, hmm. OK, so let's do a couple of values of, let's just make a little quick table here to demonstrate possible values of delta x. So n and, uh, n and delta x. Let's say negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, yada, yada, yada. Actually, and one other thing, it's clear to me that we're going to need uh, we're going to need, how do you say, we're going to need positive values here because delta x, we're saying b minus a actually, so maybe not. Whatever, let's just plug it in. We'll see what happens. <laughs> so I'll do, what I'll do is I'll do, uh, let's do starting from n equals negative 4, negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, et cetera. And I think we'll see a pattern. So we could have negative 8 times 4 plus 6. Well, that gets me negative 24. We could have, ne ooh, can I, can I do math? Negative 26. Uh, negative 8 times negative 3 is 24 plus 6. Hello. Literally can't do math twice in a row. Negative 8 times negative 4 is 32. Plus 6 makes 38. So 38. Negative 3 times negative, blah, 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 that's negative 24, so that's 30 right, 22, uh, 14, uh, 6, negative 2, negative 10, negative 18. Don't think I made any mistakes there. Let's double check. Yep, that looks good. OK, so what is this delta x? This is the last thing that I really wanted to talk about, because uh, I know we're, we're just about hit time here. But delta x is the difference, so x, b, xa. It's the difference between these two positions, these two distances to a point in space. So for example, um, let's find a position where xb minus xa is negative 2. Yeah, let's do that. So I want to find a position where the distance measured from b that's xb, this, this length right here, minus the distance measured from a is negative 2, xa. OK. So um, 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 um. Oops, hello. So what we'll do is, I think it's going to be these two is my guess. xb minus xa is negative 2. OK, so 6 and 2 are the ones of interest. Yeah. So a position between 0 and 8 equals negative 2. Where does that happen? Well. It's going to be a region where xa, the distance from, measured from a, is bigger than xb, the distance measured from b. Uh, so I have a feeling it's going to be right at 5. Let's check that. So 
if I pick x a like this, boom, that's a distance of five. If I pick x b, that's a distance of three. x b equals three, x a equals five. So x b minus x a is negative two here. So this is a point of destructive interference. And I actually think that's going to be the only one for us this time, because all the other points outside are like way over here. They're eight away. So the next one is at 13. And over here, the next one is at negative three. So th I think this is the only point that we mark for destructive interference here. But what about the one that says delta x is equal to six? So the one where delta x equals to six is going to be Whoa, hello. Uh, this one is gonna, is gonna be, I believe, it's gotta be where x b minus x a is negative two. Would that just be at one? Or, yeah, yeah, one, so it'd be um, seven minus one. Seven minus one. That gives me six. I think you're right. Wait, what, how does that make sense? Let me think about this. XB minus XA in that situation is, yep, that's it, makes six. XB minus XA. Yeah, okay, this is weird. XA is one, XB is eight or seven, that makes six. That makes destructive interference here. Yeah, I tend to agree. Let me double check myself, make sure I'm not going crazy here. Yeah, okay, I agree. So to kind of hash that through one last time, for this other one, we've got XA, which is one, and we've got XB, which is seven. So XB minus XA in that situation, is six, which matches with this condition down here. So we have n equals zero and n equals one. Those are situations where uh, we have positions in between the two towers. Good catch, thanks for that. <laughs> all right, um, I think that's all we really wanna talk about for this problem. Let me talk about B briefly here, just because, you know, to, to try to round it out a little bit, but we probably won't do a detailed solution because I actually kind of got to run folks. <laughs> but okay, B, at the locations you find a part A, can the interference be made constructive by changing the phase constants of the two towers? If yes, which values of the phase constant would do this? So I want to say yes. So no matter what, our points of constructive, or our points of uh, destructive interference are going to be separated by a half wavelength. Yep, that makes sense. So the points are always gonna be separated by half wavelength. What changing that initial phase will do is it can shift where the destructive and constructive interference points are. So if I wanted to do that, I could resolve the problem um, to find values of, here we go, this guy, such that at our values of delta x, we have constructive interference. So to kind of like resolve it, it would look something like this. I would have my same table as before. And this is probably going to be confusing, <laughs> but I'll try it anyway. So I would have the same thing before. I would have multiple possible values of delta x, negative pi over four delta x. These values would have to be two, negative two, and six. I would leave my delta phi naught as a variable. And I would try to find the appropriate values to make this the case. And then I'd say such that it is an integer multiple of pi, 2n pi. Resolving this. So, so would you solve it separately for each one? Neg you plug in like negative 2 first and then solve and then plug in 6 again and solve? That's right. Yep. Okay. Um, and in fact, it should be the same value. It should be the same value of phi naught or an equivalent value. So you should really only need to solve it once.
Okay, I think what I'll go ahead and do is end the recording here. Wait, we've got a couple of chats coming in. Let's see what those are. Ah, okay, gotcha. So I think what I'll do is I'll go ahead and end the recording here. Thanks for joining us on YouTube if you, uh, if you have the time. Um, let me know if you have more questions. Email's fine uh, or just on the Discord and we will see you all next time.